So what does God give us if we will humble ourselves? Well, there's a lot of things. One of them, the most important thing, is God gives us salvation. There is one word that is referred to in the Bible when it talks about salvation. It's a pretty common word. It's called a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Who does God gift salvation to? The religious? No. God gifts salvation to the humble. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of hope for the humble. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it pays to be humble. It reminds me of the story that I heard about. These, um, there was these five people up in a plane. One was the pilot. There was a doctor up there. There was a lawyer. There was a preacher. And there was a little kid. And they get up in the air and they run into some turbulence, you know, when they're up there. Run into some difficulties, some mechanical difficulties. So the pilot says, he turns around, he looks at everybody and he goes, look, I got some bad news. I the... Uh, this plane's going down. And he said, um, and there's only four parachutes on this plane, and I'm taking one of them, so I'll see y'all later. So he jumps out of the plane, you know. So the doctor, he stands up and he says, look, I've saved a lot of lives, so since I've saved a lot of lives, I think that I deserve to have a parachute and have my life saved at this. So he grabbed a parachute and he jumped out of the plane. And then this lawyer stood up and said, well, I am the smartest man in the on the earth. I'm the smartest man alive. And so I just, I can't let my brain go down in this plane. And uh, I need to, so he grabbed a parachute and he jumped out the plane. So now it's just left a preacher and a little kid. And so the preacher looks at the little kid and he goes, look, son, I'm an older preacher. I've, I've lived a good life. I've, I've had, I've had a good run. I, I don't have any regrets. I'm ready to go to heaven. Why don't you just take the last parachute and jump out of the plane and I'll go down with the plane and the and the little kid says, oh, don't worry about it, preacher. He goes, the smartest man in the room grabbed my backpack. <laughs> Pride will get you in trouble, won't it? And so a lot of times we, we, you know, we read passages like we read last week in Philippians chapter 2. And I got to tell you, I mean, that was a hard sermon to preach and probably was a hard sermon for you to hear. And it's maybe even a harder sermon to live. Because I have found this in culture, and that is that, in particular, as we as we get kind of worse and worse in our culture, whatever culture says is the thing to do, oftentimes the Bible is telling you to do the exact opposite. So, then the reason why I'm saying this is I was just reminded of this truth this week. I, I, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts because I'm on the road a lot, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. I listen to a lot of sermons, and I was. Uh, one of one of the preachers that I really enjoy listening to is a pastor in New York called Tim Keller, and he has a podcast out. And I was listening to Tim preach about money. He was talking about money. He's preaching through Proverbs, and he was talking about money. And he made the statement in his sermon. He said that every every principle that we have been taught as Americans, a lot of times, is in complete violation to how. Uh, God says that we should deal with our money, that, that this is what the American culture says, and this is what, this is what we're encouraged to do, but, this, but the Bible has a totally radical different view. And that's what I think we're kind of walking through with this text, because in our culture, our culture tells us to live for ourselves. Our culture says to, to take care of ourselves. And then if you have anything left over, then you take care of other people. You know, you, you give to yourself first, and then you give to others if you have anything left over, that this is kind of what our culture tells us. It's a very selfish culture. Jesus then comes on the scene, and I want you to understand, this is not an indictment on just the American culture. This is just culture, and this is the world in general. So it's not like you go to another country and people are less selfish. People are selfish all over the world, okay? So Jesus comes on the scene, though, and he says in verse number four of Philippians 2, let each of you look not look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. He's not saying to neglect yourself, but he's just saying make sure that you not only look out for your interests, but you also look out for the interest of others as well. Be unselfish. Care for other people. Don't just live your life by yourself. So then he gave us last week this supreme example of Jesus Christ, which is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he said, 
He, he tells us what to do in verse 4, then in verse 5 he gives us an example. Well, what did Jesus do? We looked at four things last week. He says, if I have the mind of Christ, I will lift others up, even if it means lowering myself. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So God emptied himself of his glory, of his heavenly glory, his godly glory, and he became, he did, he, he became man. He put himself in that position. He did not lose his deity, but he became like a man, suffering in a sense the same, dealing with the same issues that we deal with. So he, he did all of that. He went low, 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 all the way to the lowest point, which was death on the cross. Why did he do that? So he could push us up. That's why he did that. So if, if we're going to be like Christ, that it means lowering ourselves, lowering ourselves, lowering ourselves to lift others up. We talked about that last week. Then we said that it means helping others, even if it means humbling myself. Being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. So I want to help you even if it means uh, me putting myself in a humbling type position. Then we, we want to serve others even if it means submitting myself. So I want to put myself in a, a position. I don't want to look at you're here to serve me, but I'm here to serve you. And I get my life gets all out of whack when I kind of have that mentality. If I go into my marriage with Karen's here to serve me, <laughs> Good luck on that marriage, right? I mean, that does, it's, it's going to end poorly. So if I want to have the mind of Christ, I want to go into my marriage with the attitude of how can I serve you? How can I help you? Uh, and then I want to save others even if it means sacrificing myself. So I feel like, man, after last week that a lot of people were maybe discouraged or, man, this is a lot harder than I thought. This is a lot more difficult than I thought. And I never want to lie to you from this pulpit. I never want to say anything unintentionally that, uh, uh, that, would, that would not be the truth. And I, I want to tell you that living this way a lot of times is painful, and it hurts, and it's difficult. Because when you live this way, you will have people use you. If you don't ever want to be used, don't live like Jesus. Because when you... Really give yourself like Christ gave himself. People will use you. People will take advantage of you. They will get what they can out of you, and then they'll move on. They will forget you. They will abandon you. This is the reality of, of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm not trying to paint this negative, dreary picture, but I just want to be honest with you because that's the way they treated Christ. When he got to his lowest point, who was there with him? Not very many, right? His mother, Mary, was there, Mary Magdalene, and one of the disciples. That's it. How many hundreds of people did Jesus heal when he was here? He healed hundreds. How many thousands did he feed? How many thousands did he take care of? So you would think that, that we would return in kind, that they would say, okay, you know what? Jesus is at his darkest hour, at his lowest point. He was with me in my lowest point, so I'll be with him in his lowest point. But the, the reality is, is that there were three people there. Peter's standing outside going, don't know the man, never seen him, have nothing to do with him. And he was his top disciple. So living this way may hurt you. It may bring pain into your life. And I, and I can just tell you, as somebody that's been a follower of Jesus now for 41 years and have given my life in service to God, it, it, it can be painful. And, and I would not be honest with you if I did not say that it gets so painful sometimes that you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Because... I just see all these other people, and I see how they're living, and I see that things seem to be working out well for them, and, and maybe I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in a particular area. So we're all tempted, every one of us, at some point or another in our Christian walk, you will be tempted to throw in the towel. If you, if you have never done that, then you're not really living like Christ. So that's where we kind of left off last week was... Look, 
the greatest, the, the greatest thing you can do with your life is to live your life like Jesus. But you also need to understand that there will be dark moments where people will turn on you and, and they will abandon you and they will take advantage of you. But my encouragement today is to give you some hope because that verse doesn't end. When we got to verse 8, it says, he went so low that he went to the point of death on the cross. It doesn't stop there. We have verse 9. And what does 9 say? Would you guys put that up on the screen? Let's, let's read these verses together, okay, just to keep you awake in the service today. Let's read 9, 10, and 11 together. You ready? Here we go. Therefore, God also has highly and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every that Jesus Christ is Lord to the So what Paul is doing here is saying Jesus went low but God lifted him up. So there's so many verses in the Bible that kind of affirm this. So if Jesus was treated this way by God, God will treat you the same way. So if if you want to be exalted, it requires humility on your part. It it, It requires you becoming like Jesus. But Jesus will not leave you in the depths. He will lift you up. And that's what I want to encourage you with this morning. There are four things that this text teaches us about and gives us hope for hum for humility. If you're trying to live a humble life, you're trying to live, and I would call a humble life living a life like Jesus. So if you're trying to live a life like Jesus and and it's not being really accepted and you don't think it's working out for you, I want to give you some hope this morning. Okay, there are several things. One, God sees the humble. So we have all of this that Jesus did in 6, 7, and 8, and then it starts in verse 9 with the words, therefore, Therefore, God also. So now God comes on the scene. So Jesus has done all this. Now God steps in. And I just want to encourage you this morning. God sees you, and he knows what you are going through. And God looks at us differently than we look at one another. What does the Bible say? Man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? In the heart. God looks at the heart. Men look on the outside. We look at who's tall and who has broad shoulders and who's good looking and who has, who has, uh, who has a lot of money. And who, we look on the external things. God looks at the heart. And God has always chosen people that had the right heart. When the people of Israel chose their first king, you know who they picked out? They picked out a guy that was the tallest guy in all of Israel, Saul. That's who they chose. So Saul turns out to be a catastrophic failure. He started out decent, but then he, he becomes this catastrophic failure. So bad that God says, I'm taking the kingdom away from your family and I'm giving it to another. So, so God goes out to pick a new king. So what does he look for? Does he look for tall, dark, broad, and handsome? Hanson? Hanson? Don't know what Hanson is. Handsome? Handsome? You know what I mean, right? Good looking. How about that? No. God, he looks at the heart. So, so God speaks to this prophet Samuel. Samuel goes to this guy's house named Jesse. And, and he says to Jesse, Jesse, um, God is going to give Israel a new king, and it's going to come from one of your boys. I want you to bring your sons out to me so that God can tell me who's the next king. Well, what, is, what does Jesse do? He does, he does what all of us would do. They go get the firstborn. Go get the firstborn kid. Most potential, oldest, more, most mature. Brings him out in front of Samuel. Samuel says, mm, no. God, God says to Samuel, no, that's not. And he goes through all these kids. And who's the one that gets chosen? It's, so, it's, it's, it's like David is so off the radar that Samuel looks at, at, uh, at uh, Jesse and goes, you, you got any more boys? Or is this it? This is all you got? Oh, you, well, there's David. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's David. But he's like a shepherd. He's like watching sheep. I mean, surely the next king of Israel wouldn't just be a shepherd. I mean, would he? So he goes out and he gets him and brings him in. And what does God say to Samuel? That's the one. What was God looking at? The heart. Not the credentials, not the potential. He's looking at the heart. That's how God. 
So the same thing is true when they chose, when God chose a woman to bring his son into the world. Who did he choose? Mary of Nazareth. This little obscure town that when Jesus actually started making a difference and making a name, people said, is that Jesus of Nazareth? Because nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But what did God see? God saw this teenage girl, and she was a teenage girl, when she was impregnated with the Son of God by the Holy Spirit. She was this teenage girl who just had a heart for God. And God saw that. Because why? God sees the humble. I love the story that Jesus tells in Luke 18 about the two guys that went into the temple. And one guy, is, he's face down. He won't even look up. He's just face down on the ground. And, and he's, he's saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you have this other guy who's pompous and arrogant, and he walks into the room, and he, and he's, and he looks down at this guy that's on the ground, and he goes... And he says, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not like this loser. And Jesus said, who of the two guys do you think walked out of there justified? They both walked in the same building. Which two walked out justified? Well, it was the one that humbled himself. Because why? God doesn't look at our performance at what we're doing. He looks at our heart. So I want to encourage you, God sees your heart. Keep doing the right thing even if nobody else is applauding you for it or embracing you for it or loving you for it or encouraging you to keep on doing it, you do the right thing because God sees it. And God will one day, just as he lifted Jesus up, he will lift you up too. So God sees. God sees the humble. Two, God listens to the humble. God listens to the humble. So it says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him. Last week in our text, I, I referenced to you John 17. John 17 was, uh, was one of the last prayers of Jesus before he was, went to the cross and before he, went to, uh, um, before he was then placed in the tomb and rose from the dead. So he's, he's praying this prayer. And most of that prayer, it's an amazing prayer. Most of that prayer is for us. He's praying for us. But he does say in that prayer, Father, Please restore me to the please restore me to the glory that I had before I came to earth. And God answered his prayer because the the text says therefore God has also highly exalted him. Jesus prayed that he would be restored to his previous glory and after the resurrection and after the ascension he was placed in his original place. God listens to the humble. I love Psalms 10, 17. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. Now, that's an interesting phrase. You will cause your ear to hear. So if God knows all and hears all and sees all, what does it mean when he says that he, he doesn't hear my prayer? Well, I think there's a couple of ways that you can look at. One of it is, look, I have kids, and now my kids are pretty much grown and almost out of the house. To, and, and my point is, is that, you know, when my kids were little, they'd come to me and, and Dad, I want this, 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 and this. Well, if I didn't like their attitude, I would be like, okay, this needs to change before we're giving out stuff. A lot of people, they come to God with their list. God, I want A, B, C, D, and E. And God says, oh, wait, before I hear that prayer, let's deal with your heart a little bit. Let's deal with your arrogance a little bit. Let's deal with your pride a little bit. Because God will listen to the humble, and, and, but he will resist the proud. He's going to work on you if you come to God proud. And that's why submission is the key. How did Jesus pray when he was here? He always prayed with a submissive heart. This is what he did in the garden. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but... Are you with me this morning, church? Thy will be done. So I just want to encourage you. If, if you say, I'm living this life for Christ, and I'm humbling myself, and I'm doing what Jesus did, and, and it's really hard right now, I want you to know that God sees you, 
And if you have an attitude of humility, God hears you. He hears your prayers, and he will respond in time. The third thing is God gives to the humble. The third thing we learn here, that it's important for us to live like Jesus. These are the benefits. God sees us and sees us in a positive way. God listens to us. He listens to the humble. God gives to the humble. So this is, I want to teach you what I learned this week. I didn't know, I didn't learn this this week till I uh, did some studying and heard a couple of pastors preach on it. And man, it really jumped out to me. It says, okay, so nine says, therefore, so Jesus humbled himself. Therefore, God had also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Well, I always thought that that name was Jesus. Because it says, uh, then he says in verse two, that at the name of Jesus. So that right there should give a little indication that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess of those, uh, uh, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord is the name. The name is not Jesus. Everybody, there was a bunch of people in the world at the time whose name was Jesus. So, So that's why when it says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, well, what does that mean? Well, there was Jesus of Galilee, there was Jesus of Jerusalem. There was a lot of common names. I, I talked to somebody recently who had some objections to Christianity, and they were talking about, well, there was a whole bunch of Jesus. Yes, there was. In the time that Jesus walked the earth, that was a common name. People called their kids Jesus. It was just like, you know, uh, Matthews are pretty common. We named our kids Matthew. So there's a lot of Matthews. Any other Matthews in the room? Okay, terrible illustration. All right, but there are, there are, there are a few, right? Matthew is a fairly common name. Jesus is a, was a common name. But God says, What I'm going to do for you, since you have humbled yourself, I'm going to give you a a special name, and that name is Lord. And there's two terms for Lord in the Bible. One is like Lord, like if there's a a man has servants and 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 those people are his Lord. Then there's the term for God, capital L, Lord. Jesus was given the name Lord, and at the name Lord, every knee will bow, both those in heaven, on the earth, and those under the earth. God gives to the humble. He gave Jesus the name Lord. That's what when Jesus comes back, Revelation teaches us that he will have a banner on his chest and it will say, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's his name. That's the name given to Jesus by God. What does that teach us? God gives to the humble. So what does God give us if we will humble ourselves? Well, there's a lot of things. One of them, the most important thing, is God gives us salvation. That's the most important. There is one word that is referred to in the Bible when it talks about salvation. It's a pretty common word. It's called a gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Who does God gift salvation to? The religious? No. God gifts salvation to the humble. The wages of sin is what, church? It is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is salvation? It's a gift from God. Who does God gift that to? The humble. Okay, Jesus died in between two thieves, right? You got two thieves on the either side of Jesus when he died. Remember, one was over here, and they were like, if you're God, then take us down off this cross. This is the, this is the world. This is the modern world. If there is a God, why is, there, why is there sickness in the world? Why is he not changing this circumstance? Why is this happening? Why is there bad stuff? This is the world over here, kind of, They're they're screaming at Jesus, if you are the Son of God, do this. Do this for me. On the flip side, you got this guy over here, and he's like, hey, dude, shut up. That's not in in the original. That's, That's my loose interpretation. But it's interesting about that text. You know, it says at the beginning, they were both mocking him. And then finally one, he's watching Jesus and how he's responding to this. And he says, hey, you shut up over there. He goes, we're hanging here because we deserve it. 
This man has done nothing to deserve what he's hanging here for. So you be quiet. We're getting what we deserve. We robbed the bank. We stole. We did the crime. We're paying for the deeds. We're getting what we deserve. And then he looks at Jesus, and what does he say? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what did he do? He acknowledged that he was a sinner. He acknowledged Jesus as Lord, and he asked him to save him. What did Jesus say? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You do not get to heaven through your own works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. So what it requires on my part is humility. It requires childlike faith to say, I can't, I'm not capable of getting there on my own. I need God's help. So it's saying to God, God, I know who I am and I know what I deserve. And I, I know what Jesus has done and my hope is in him. That's, and so when you come to Christ that way, God gives you the gift. He gives the humble salvation. I like 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Put on humility. For why? God resists the proud. That's very, very strong. That word there, resists, is a very strong word. He's saying God actively works against you when you are proud. But, so that's the negative. God resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. So you want salvation, you want grace, you want everlasting life, you want hope, you come humbly to Jesus. He'll give it to you. He gives to the humble. Number four, the fourth thing we learn here is that God honors the humble. God honors the humble. What does it say is going to happen one day? And I believe that um, obviously... This is a speaking of the uh, great white throne judgment where every person will stand and give an account to God for their life, okay? And that every person at one point or another will say, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he says, one of these days, the demons in hell will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. They did that when he was here. When Jesus showed up in Jerusalem, satanic activity went through the roof. You know why I went through the roof? Because light was in the room. Okay? I mean, there was, it got intense because these demons knew who Jesus was. These fallen angels knew who Jesus was. One of these days, they would acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Every man, woman, boy and girl that has ever walked this planet will one day acknowledge that Jesus Christ is is Lord. You can either do it in this life or you'll do it someday. You can do it willingly or you one day will be forced. And then everything in heaven, the angels sing the glory of God. They testify to who God is. God has glorified. He has glorified his son, Jesus Christ, for, the, for how low he went. How was Jesus exalted? There are four ways. One, the resurrection. The resurrection was God exalting his son. Two, was the ascension. Jesus walked on this earth for 40 days. After the 40 days, after his resurrection, he interacted with over 500 people. He had over 500 witnesses see him. He went to the top of the Mount of Olives with his disciples, and without warning, just... That's his, that was God exalting, honoring his son. He was, he was honored through his exaltation. The Bible says this about Jesus. He is setting in heaven by the throne of God sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And that's the fourth, intercession. He is pleading our case to God the Father. That's how God exalted Jesus. How are we exalted? God saves us. God is in the process of sanctifying us. And one of these days, God will glorify us and give us a perfect body that is without sin and will never fade away. If you come humbly to God, he will save you. He will... He will keep working on you till you die, and then one of these days when you do die, he'll give you a new body and a new nature, 
and you'll never sin again, and you'll be forever with Jesus. That's what you get if you'll just be humble for just a little while. But oh man, does the world tell you, live for today, live for now, do what makes you feel good, throw caution to the wind. Let me tell you something. As I have gotten older, and I am getting older, Unfortunately, as I've gotten older, I do not look back on regret with the things I did right. I look back on regret for the things I did wrong that I thought were right at the time. It's worth it to do the right thing. Just don't give up. This is what the Bible constantly tells us to do. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. This is what Paul was saying. He says, don't be weary in well-doing. It gets t- you get tired, man. You get tired. So when I used to run, <laughs> I don't run much anymore, but when I used to run, I used to just tell myself, so I'd run this, I basically had this four-mile trek that I'd run around my house, you know, and and I would get to, there was this one spot going up to 35th Street, and it's kind of this hill, and I'd be on this hill, and I'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to get to that corner, and when I get to that corner, I'll call Karen and have her come pick me up. But I'm not going to quit till I get to that corner. So it just literally became kind of one foot in front of the other. Right? I'm just going to get up. I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And you know what would happen a lot of times? I'd get to that corner and go, huh, I feel pretty good. I'm going to run to the next quarter. And sure enough, three quarters of the way, oh, man, I, I got my cell phone. I'm going to oh, I'll just make it. i just make it to that corner. And let me tell you, sometimes the Christian life's like that. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other, and then one of these days you're going to cross the finish line, and you're going to be like Paul who said, where he says, I heard, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other, and one of these days, it's going to be worth it. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't turn around. Don't abandon your faith. Don't turn on the Lord. Stay humble. And what does the text say? It says in 1 Peter 5, 6, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When's due time? Because I'd like to know when due time is, right? I don't know when due time is, but I know it'll be at just the right time. And I wonder how many people were almost there and they turned around and they gave up. Don't give up because God will exalt you in due time. Look, it may not be here. It may not be on this earth. But you will be exalted in due time. And I will promise you this. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I will promise you this. That he will give you grace to get through whatever you got to go through. Just keep moving. All right? Keep moving. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. With our heads bowed, I would like for you to, I would like to ask you two questions. One is, have you ever done what the thief on the cross did? Did Have you ever acknowledged who you are and humbly come to Jesus and ask him to save you? If you've never done that, would you do it right now? Would you do it right now? Just in your seat where you are, would you just pray something like this? Lord, I know that you are my Savior. And I know who I am, a sinner. 
And I am today acknowledging my sin. And I'm trusting in you and you alone, Jesus, to save me. I can't get to heaven without you. Please come in my life. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you are in heaven now. Help me to live for you. With our heads bowed and no, nobody looking around. Maybe you're here today and you're like, you know, I'm going through a really tough time right now, Pastor Mark, and I, I, I would like, I feel like quitting the faith. Nobody's going to look around. Nobody's going to notice. And, and these, your raised hand is just you kind of saying, Pastor Mark, I, would you please pray for me because I'm struggling right now. Would anybody raise their hand? Anybody in the room? Anybody? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand down here to my right. In the center here. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Back to my right. Thank you. I see your hand. Yes, in the center, I see your hand. Father, I want to thank you for these people that had the honesty to raise their hand, that they're really struggling right now. And I, I want to pray for them specifically. I want to pray, Lord, that you would give them an extra dose of grace to get through what they're going through right now. They need your touch, Lord. They need your encouragement. They need your strength. So would you please give that to them? Would you please grant them grace to get through their journey? And I want to pray, Lord, for the people in this room who didn't raise their hand but are struggling. Because I think there's probably more than two in the room. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them what they need. Pray they would reach out to a friend. And I pray most of all that they would not give up. Lord, it's getting harder and harder in our culture to follow you. We are becoming more and more despised and hated. Help us to stay true. Help us to stay true to our dying breath. But we can't do that without you because we so want to conform to culture and we so want to be like everybody else. And if most people are like me. They want to be liked and loved. So we need a special touch from you, Lord. And we're holding on to the promises in your word that one of these days, it's all going to be better. And we look forward to that day. And we long for it. And we pray it in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to our series on Philippians with Pastor Mark Doss. If you have questions about today's message, please contact our church office at info at topekabaptist.org. Give us a call at 785-862-0988 or check us out online at topekabaptist.org.